Uh, we have a very intriguing session. Uh, of all the sessions that I was preparing for, this is the one that I least knew where it would go. And, had, uh, <laughs> and, and I'm most intrigued to see what we're going to make of it. I, I'm very pleased to have representatives of two organizations that you know, I guess probably don't get onto a technology or social networking platform that often. You don't immediately think of as technology companies. Um, and yet, I, absolutely at the heart of the global um, you know, phenomena of, of, of developing markets and um, you know, connecting people and so forth. And uh, immediately to my left is Shelley Leibovitz, who's um, the CIO of the World Bank. Um, you know, which I, I guess if you had to ask people to name a, an organization that they suspected was the least tech savvy in the world <laughs> uh, a few years ago, at least before Shelley joined, then they might have come top of that. Uh, and then on the far left is Stephen Rubino, who's uh, the CIO of the, uh, well, what's now the New York Stock Exchange Euronext company. You know, after the next round of mergers, who knows what it will be called, but and it keeps evolving. So I just wanted to ask you both, I mean, these are sort of great institutions, but to what extent are they technology companies and, and have they become, I mean, how is your technology and your role as a technology company evolving? Um, Shelley. Matthew, thank you. And um, thank you for, for your interest. I know it's late in the day. Um, I'm relatively new to the World Bank. I've been at the bank for two years and it's interesting because when most people think of the bank, I think you think of a very old line traditional institution. You know, our roots are we were founded as part of uh, post-World War II reconstruction from the Bretton Woods Agreement in 1944. You know, these tremendous historical roots. And we, I think we have a reputation of being this very old line group of research economists. And it's been a pleasure for me to find not only the change, but the appetite for change in the institution. And I think it takes two very different forms. One form is the institution itself. So for example, our, um, our president, Robert Zellick, made a speech at Georgetown University last year, and he talked about the democratization of development economics. And you can only democratize through technology. And as part of that, we launched what we call our open agenda, which is about open knowledge, open data, open solutions. So one of the things that the bank is well known and highly respected for is a, a group of development indicators and research indicators in terms of how we're progressing on things relating to pro poverty and progress and po prosperity. So historically, we, we um, charge for these indicators. And our new policies, for example, have us We've made more than 4,000 indicators public, and we've encur encouraged other NGOs, CSOs, general citizenship to use those indicators to find productive, creative, and innovative ways to help the development mission. We ran an Apps for Development competition last year and had more than 100 submissions from 36 different countries, 30 of them in Africa. So in terms of how our own institution works, there's really been a sea change and a wonderful sea change in terms of an understanding and a perception that we are part of a global citizenship, we are a global public good, and that we are not the masters of all knowledge and innovation. We are part of an ecosystem of development and development economics that when we collaborate and when we reach out and when we open our doors and make the walls of our institution porous, everybody benefits. So it's been interesting to see the philosophical change within the institution. And then of course we do a great deal in the way of ICT. ICT is one of our major um, sectors. And when we think of ICT in the developing world, we really think of it in three different thematic areas. We think about building out connectivity, we think about skills and industry, and we think about transformation. Transformation being primarily service delivery and how governments interact and um, communicate with their citizenship. How do they get feedback? How do they show accountability? How do they interact in general? So those are the three areas where they've been very important themes. I mean, we have a $2 billion telecommunications portfolio globally in terms of investments to build out basic connectivity. So it's really interesting to see how important 
technology is not only to our institution, but to how we interact with and advise our clients and how we're looking to help alleviate poverty. Stephen. Uh, well, for those of you who may not know, everyone's familiar with the New York Stock Exchange being that icon just a little bit south of us here. The Euronext portion of our title reflects the European exchanges we operate too. So we operate exchanges in the US and in Europe. And if you talk about age of companies, the oldest member of our portfolio is the Amsterdam Stock Exchange, which is the first stock exchange in the world. So we're about a 400-year-old company. And yet, we are a technology company. We have to be, because uh, in these rapidly changing times where the marketplaces that we operate are primarily machines talking to machines, not so much as it used to be people typing on keyboards, typing in orders. And when you have machines talking to machines, our primary goal is to remove as much friction from the environment as we can. And by friction, I mean we want things to be as fast as they can. We want things to be as cost effective as they can. We want them to be as secure as they can and reliable as they can. So that, and I think this was mentioned earlier today, we want our uh, role as a facilitator, bringing buyers and sellers together to be as transparent as we can make it because then we've done a really good job. And I should also mention that because we think we do a pretty good job of what we do and because our customers think we do a pretty good job, anything that we develop, whether it be products, services, uh, software, hardware combinations, uh, we sell that. We sell that to anybody that it makes sense to sell it to. So for instance, if someone from a former Soviet Republic says, we'd like to set up a new market for financial instruments, uh, we, and we think you're pretty good at technology, would you help us with it? We'd say, sure, we'd help you with it. And I, I should also add that uh, one of the things that I do in particular when I think about the class of problems we're trying to solve is uh, I, I try not to pigeonhole us into saying we are a marketplace for financial instruments we, only. We do a pretty good job of that, but I try and think of the general problem that we're trying to solve. And in a more interconnected world where you have almost, almost infinite bandwidth, if you're not watching too many Netflix movies, and if you keep on going down that route, we can, more and more marketplaces can either be of, of all sorts, bringing buyers and sellers together, it doesn't have to be financial instruments, uh, that we approach our technology problems that way, that we can create a marketplace if we, so, if we were so interested for just about anything that anyone wanted to buy or sell and they thought that we would be the right place to make that happen. So Shelley, I mean, one of the, I think, critiques of traditional development policy has been that the international institutions would come in and they would do whatever they thought from their you know, ivory towers or whatever yeah. ought to be done and there would be no feedback whatsoever, no consultation really with people on the ground um, and often as a result it would not actually work. Um, I mean, is technology going to create those feedback loops, bring people in who are the actual supposed beneficiaries of the, the World Bank's good intentions and I mean, are we going to see a real transformation in that area? So it's a, great, it's a great question because we've had to move way beyond well-intentioned development. I mean, we are very focused on results. There is never enough money. There are always too many good things to do with the pool of money you have, regardless of that pool of money. So you have to move beyond well-intentioned development to results-based development. It's interesting. There's no sil silver bullet, but we've done things like for our spring meetings and annual meetings, which I think traditionally have been groups of finance ministers and heads of state who convene in Washington or other cities around the world in what are viewed as very closed sessions. We have changed those meetings to be open, web-based, interactive, to take, um, you know, take questions from the field, to have them podcast, to make that available in a much more open and collaborative way. I think we've changed our view of development in terms of thinking development is working solely and only with governments. It is all about partnerships. It is all about the public and the private sectors. It is all about citizens. It is all about a whole ecosystem of knowledge and collaboration working together. So knowledge is a big part of our vocabulary. It's interesting, Steve, when you talked about creating marketplaces, we tend to believe that we are um, a convener of knowledge. So we have the ability to bring knowledge together in ways that are productive. We want to program in one country, and other countries can benefit from it. And what's interesting is this is no longer about the developed world teaching the developing world. 
there is knowledge, there is innovation, there are insights that are coming from all different directions. So I mean, it's been interesting to see a site like Ushahidi take off and Absolutely. become a, a real sort of way of figuring out where uh, pressure points are and so forth. I mean, are you, do you work with sites like that and, and make use of that information? We do. We have, um, you know, we have partnerships. We have um, outreach in just about every direction because it's the only productive way to work these days. There's so much more benefit in terms of crowdsourcing. With the earthquake in Haiti, for example, there were all kinds of um, efforts with crisis camps and random acts of kindness to be able to do geomapping, to be able to develop little mobile applications in order to help the aid and recovery process. So a crowdsourcing, a collaborative approach is critical to what we do.